Hello everyone, Jolene here from Bookworm Adventure Girl. Welcome back. I hope that you are all well. Today we are going to be talking about one of Atwood's non-fiction novels uh, or non-fiction books and I also have an exciting announcement to make. Yes, it's about Margaret Atwood and yes, it's about an Atwood book. So first, I have to apologize because I rescheduled everything. I rescheduled the whole reading schedule and then I haven't really exactly been following it. Um, the reason for this is because I thought that I had found all of my Atwood books in one of the boxes. And while I did find an entire box of Atwood books, um, most of them were the books that we've already read. So I am trying to find the Atwood books that we haven't read yet so that I can start reading them. And once I find the box, I will start doing a couple of books a week to, to catch up. So I've just been doing one a week, even though the schedule is a little bit different, so that we can continue every Monday. Um, but now um, I really need to find the books because I don't have the next few books that we that are in our schedule. So I do have some digging around to do and I will get there. Um, anyway, let's move on to this week's book, which is Curious Pursuits, Occasional Writing. Now, I have to admit that I didn't realize what this book was um, when I first put it on the list, and it might seem like it's cheating in a way, but it turns out that this is going to flow uh, quite nicely into the announcement that I have for you, so stay tuned for that. Um, the reason that I am calling Curious Pursuits a bit of a cheat <laughs> is because we've actually already read most of this. Curious Pursuits is the UK publication of Atwood's essays and reviews. It's kind of like um, Second Words and Moving Targets combined, uh, sort of. And it's the sort of that made me decide to keep it uh, in our reading schedule. So you might remember that um, Second Words has reviews, essays, and uh, writing from 1960 to 1982. And then Moving Targets continues that from 1982 to 2004. So Curious Pursuits uh, doesn't include any writings until 1970, and it goes a year longer until 2005. So now we recently read Moving Targets just a couple of weeks ago, so don't worry, I'm not going to go through everything again and talk about it all over. Um, but I would like to make uh, maybe a few comparisons with Curious Pursuits. I'll highlight a couple of differences and then talk about, um, there's a few of the essays that are included uh, from 2005. So then we'll all be caught up. Um, so Curious Pursuits was published in 2005. Um, Moving Targets and Second Words were not published in the UK. So this is the collection that they did publish, which you know, Atwood calls um, in the general introduction of this book, she calls it a grab bag of occasional pieces. Um, and like Second Words um, and Moving Targets, Curious Pursuits is divided into three sections um, with a completely different general introduction um, from Margaret Atwood. So I do want to maybe share a little bit of the general introduction um, from Curious Pursuits with you. And I'm going to begin with, um, it's the second paragraph, let's have to find it here, on Roman numeral 11. Looking back over the decades, I find I've averaged about 20 of these pieces a year. I've spared the reader the political ephemera having to do with such things as mayoralty elections in Toronto and the shame on you environmentalist pieces most of them, and the Gilbert and Sullivan style parodies done for people's retirement celebrations, and the mangled pop songs performed by myself and whatever other stooges I could corral in order to raise money for such organizations as Penn. Canadians have a long tradition of making idiots of themselves in public for worthy causes, a tradition I stand firmly behind. I began writing occasional pieces in the 1950s when I was 16. I was the designated reporter for my school's home and school association meetings, and my account of these sometimes fraud events appeared in the mimographed newsletter that was sent around to the parents to keep them informed on such topics as the proper length of girls' skirts. 
By this age, I had decided to be a dedicated novelist, a very dedicated one, with the resulting lung illnesses, unhappy affairs, alcoholism, and early death that would surely follow. But I knew I would have to have a day job in order to afford the squalid flat and the absinthe, and this was my first foray into the, into the humiliating world of turning out Grub Street hack work. Did I learn anything from this experience? I ought to have learned that for every tale there is a teller, but also a listener, and that some jokes are not suitable for all occasions, but that particular lesson took a while to sink in. Once at university, I took to producing book reviews and articles for the literary magazine, some of them under other names, since we liked to pretend back then that there were more people interested in the arts than there actually were. Like many young people, I was demanding and intolerant, but I didn't let that show too much in the reviews, which are inclined to be amiably condescending and to have too many long words and qualifying clauses in them. I continued with my reviewing after I graduated and while I was attending the Harvard Graduate School in the 1960s and while I was holding down various low paying jobs and beginning to publish poetry and fiction in small magazines. A little further along, Atwood makes an observation that we have seen in her writing. She has been very consistent with her topics and her themes. And Atwood says this, and this is on uh, Roman numeral 13. Looking back over this gathering of pages, I see that my interests have remained fairly constant over the decades. Although I like to believe their, scopes has, their scope has broadened somewhat. Some of my earlier concerns, my environmental fretting, for example, were considered lunatic fringe when I first voiced them, but have since moved to the center of the stage. I dislike advocacy writing. It's not fun because the issues that generate it are not fun, but I still feel compelled to do a certain amount of it anyway. The effects are not always pleasant since what may be simple common sense to one person is annoying polemic to another. Some of these pieces were originally lectures and speeches. I made my first speech at the age of 10. It was bad for me. I still have the stage fright in advance during the writing of the speech. I'm haunted by a metaphor from Edith Wharton's story, The Pelican, in which a public lecturer's talk is compared to the trick by which a magician produces reams and reams of blank white paper out of his mouth. I still find book reviewing a problem. It's so much like homework and it forces me to have opinions instead of the negative capability that is so much more soothing to the, to the digestion. I review anyway because those who are reviewed must review in their turn, or the principle of reciprocity fails. What Atwood also does in this book and her other nonfiction collections is she explains the title. So here is what she says about the title Curious Pursuits, and this is on um, Roman numeral 15. Why is this book called Curious Pursuits? Curious describes both my habitual state of mind, a less kind word would be nosy, as well as the subject matter of some of these writings. Like Alice, I've become curiouser and curious, curiouser myself, and the world has done the same. Another way of putting it, if something doesn't arouse my curiosity, I'm not likely to write about it. Though perhaps curious, as a word carries too light a weight, my curiosities are, I hope, not idle ones. Passionate might have been more accurate, however. It would have given a wrong impression and disappointed a few men in raincoats. As for pursuits, it's a noun that contains a verb. What can you ever do with reality but chase it around? You can't expect to capture it in any final way, because the thing keeps moving. Picture me then, butterfly net or pop gun in hand, flapping over the fields with the elusive subject flitting away in the distance, or crouched behind the bushes in hopes of catching a glimpse. A glimpse of what? That's just it, you never know. The first section of Curious Pursuits has 13 of Atwood's essays from 1970 to 1989, so it automatically cuts out the first decade um, in which Atwood mostly reviewed Canadian uh, books and authors. In second words, Atwood has 37 essays alone, uh, just from 1972 to 1982. So one of the biggest comparisons is to see what the UK editors chose to keep uh, in the collection and what they chose to remove. So the introduction for this section in Curious Pursuits begins with uh, something a little different than what we've seen. Um, and then it continues with the introductions that we've already read before. So I just wanted to share the new part with you. Um, it is more London and European centered, I guess, if you will. 
um, you know, which makes sense obviously for a UK edition. So this begins on page three. At the beginning of the 1970s, I was living in London in an area called Parsons Green, now gentrified, then in transition, which meant that the water froze in the kitchen when it was cold. Maxi coats worn with long boots and crushed velvet mini skirts were the fashion. You could get these on the King's Road, which was still in full swing. That was a year that saw both an electricity strike and a garbage strike, both of which the Londoners seemed to enjoy. It was here that I finished a book of poems called Power Politics and began a novel called Surfacing, using a typewriter with a German keyboard. Right after that, I was in France, a sublet in a town near Saint Tropez where I wrote on a rented French keyboard typewriter and conspired with the director Tony Richardson on a screenplay of my first novel, The Edible Woman. Shortly thereafter, I was in Italy, another sublet, where I finished surfacing on a typewriter with an Italian keyboard. There are some advantages to not really knowing how to type. The transitions are easier. I then returned to Toronto for two years on staff at universities, York and Toronto, and worked with a small literary publisher called House of Anansi Press. For them, I edited the poetry list. I also put together Survival, a book on Canadian writing, the first on this subject for a popular audience. The book was an immediate and a huge success in the Canada of its day, as well as being controversial. The combination of these factors, mixed with the ongoing feminism furor, caused me to be attacked a lot. Soon after that, I was to be found living on a farm with fellow writer Graham Gibson. We stayed there for nine years, working the farm in an energetic but not very financially rewarding way. We had a large kitchen garden and did a lot of canning. We even went so far as to make sauerkraut, a thing you should not do anywhere near your house. We had cows, chickens, geese, sheep, ducks, horses, cats, dogs, and peacocks, to name a few. Many of these we ate, our jolly meals punctuated by the sound of our bottles of homemade beer exploding in the cellar and Graham's children asking if this was Susan on the plate. In 1976, we had a baby and when it came time for school and we realized that the, that the child would have to spend two hours on a school bus every day, we moved into the city. During this period, we lived in Edinburgh for a year as Graham was the Canadian half of the Scottish Canadian Writers Exchange. Edinburgh outdid London by having a trucker's strike, a collapse of the train tunnel to London, and a gritter's strike. We ate a lot of Brussels sprouts, salmon, and wool. At this time, I did my first book tour in Germany. We also went around the world on our way to the Adelaide Festival in Australia, taking our 18-month-old baby and stopping in Iran. The Shah would fall eight months later. Afghanistan, the Civil War, would start six weeks after our departure. And India, where our child learned to climb stairs at a hotel in Agra, where we, where we were visiting the Taj Mahal. And then she continues um, with the 1980s, which we've already read in the other books. Now, it might seem like putting a collection together of essays that have already been written uh, would probably be simple and maybe a no-brainer, um, since a book has already been published with those things. Um, but because Curious Pursuits was published in the UK, it also had a UK editor, and you can see you know, some of the changes that were made that would totally make more sense uh, to a UK audience. So for example, um, coloring, calling Hilary Mantel's essay Little Chappies with Breasts. Um, and then another difference is the essay on English novelist Angela Carter. So in Moving Targets, the essay focused on Angela Carter's short stories. Um, but in Curious Pursuits, uh, the piece on Angela Carter is actually a write-up of a dear friend of Atwood's who, when the piece was written, had recently passed away. And Atwood pays tribute to her uh, writing this, you know, beautiful piece of work. Um, so in the third section of Curious Pursuits, which covers the time period of 2000 to 2005, Atwood includes a piece on um, English playwright Harold Pinter and it's called Pinteresque, and it focuses on how Pinter uses silence. It's a short and compelling piece, and it made me think of how uh, my dad used to some, sometimes say um, that there was power in silence, and it seems that Pinter um, had mastered that power, uh, at least according to Atwood. 
So the last three essays in Curious Pursuits are new to us um, as we're reading along. And I'm guessing that all three were written in 2005 since Moving Targets goes to 2004. So the first is called Uncovered, an American Iliad. And this piece mentions Stonehenge early on, but Atwood is actually praising Robert Bringhurst, who is a Canadian poet for his um, trilogy about the Haida myth tellers. And Atwood explains that if it were not for his work of translation and editing, among many other things that he's done, we would actually not have many of the myths and fairy tales today. And of course, we know how important these are in Atwood's you know, own works. And she talks about the importance of oral poetry. And Atwood says that um, for North Americans, um, that these poems and others like them are part of our identity, history, and story. And my mythologies would play, I think, a significant part in UK culture as well. The next piece is called Headscarves to Die For, and it is a review of Snow by Turkish writer Orhan Pamuk. I don't know if I'm saying that name correctly. Um, Atwood calls it essential reading for our time, and not only does she describe um, Pamuk as a well-respected author, but Atwood's description of Snow was so compelling that I put it on my TBR list before I even finished reading the review. <laughs> Um, and then the final piece in Curious Pursuits is 10 Ways of Looking at the Island of Dr. Moreau, and that was by um, H.G. Wells. And Atwood explains that the island of Dr. Moreau has inspired um, three films, and according to her, uh, two of them weren't very good, and um, I've never seen any of them, so I wouldn't know. Uh, and she makes a comparison to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and how you know things have now been attributed to it that didn't actually exist in the original. So in this essay, Atwood attempts to look at the symbols that are found in the tale, uh, which she admits Wells may or may not have been you know aware of. Um, they might he might not even know that they were there. And of course, Atwood also does this in the only way that she can, and by giving the reader um, a more fleshed out understanding of the literary times. So she kind of gives us a context by giving us some background and reminding us who Wells' contemporaries were, and also makes helpful comparisons, uh, which I liked. So that brings us to the end of Curious Pursuits, and it brings me to my announcement, and I'm so excited. Um, as I've been looking over Atwood's nonfiction work, this is the last collection, Curious Pursuits is the last collection that we have on our reading list. There are still um, a couple more nonfiction books, but they are about specific topics. So for her collections of essays and reviews, it has been 15 plus years since she has published a book like this. And that is what I want to tell you about. Uh, Margaret Atwood has a new book coming out on March 1st of 2022. It's called Burning Questions. The book will contain essays from 2004 until 2021. So if you've read her nonfiction so far with her essays uh, like this, then this new book will catch you up to 2021. The book is being published in Canada, in the US and in the UK. So that is definitely something to look forward to for Atwood fans. Um, of course, by then we will be done uh, with this series, so we won't be reading that together. But obviously I plan on pre-ordering the book and um, I will be sure to do a video on it when I'm done reading it. So please let me know if you have read the UK edition Curious Pursuits um, or if you have any thoughts on any of Atwood's nonfiction uh, work that we've read so far. Uh, and please keep your fingers crossed for me that I find our next few books. Um, I need to find The Tent and Moral Disorder so that I can uh, keep going for the, at least for next week. I look forward to chatting with you in the comments as always. Thanks again for watching. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and don't forget to make every day an adventure. Mm -hmm.